Hey everyone and welcome back to Just Finish Coding. My name is Sri Ram and today we will be creating a full-fledged seamless Connect 4 on Scratch. If you look at the preview, you can see some decent graphics, neat movements and overall quite a nice Connect 4 that two people can play and enjoy. The real kicker is that the seemingly complicated program is not that complicated at all. In fact, with a little bit of work, you will be able to achieve this result all on your own. Speaking of minimizing effort, here is a nice bonus for you. Rather than starting off from scratch, you can use and access all of the game images and assets that I made by myself. To get the starter file, head over to the link in the description labeled downloadable files and then download the file labeled start. Also, this Google Drive attachment will contain the code of every single part of video. So if you are stuck at any point in time and you are unable to find out where your mistake is, then you could go to this very link, download just the file that you need and then continue on with the tutorials. Right. Getting back to the starter file, if you download this and open it in the Scratch 3 online editor, you will be met by this sweet thumbnail that I crafted along with a host of other sprites. Don't worry too much about these for now. As we move on, I will explain clearly what each tasks, each sprite is meant to perform. Let's begin. First off, click on the stage or backdrops button and this will open up the area to code the scripts of the stage. When the green flag is clicked, we will first broadcast a new message called init and then wait. The broadcast and wait is quite important and you will end up with a few nasty little bugs if you broadcast and do not wait. After this, broadcast another message called start game. In the second message, the wait is not needed. On receiving the init message, we will ensure that each game sprite is properly positioned and ready. Only when all of this has happened will we begin the main game code. So when the init message is received, we will create a few new variables and set the initial values in the stage itself. The first is move on, the second is a turn and the third is game over. I'd recommend sticking to my naming convention. Name all the public variables, that is the variables meant for all sprites in uppercase and all the private variables, that is the variables meant only for a particular sprite in lowercase. Now set move on to yes, turn to red and game over to no. You should be easily able to guess what the turn and game over variables are for and I will explain what the move on variable does when we program the coin. Now that we are ready to set up the board's background and the board's front, let's go ahead and do it. These two are fairly simple and straightforward, just a couple of lines each. After init, we go to x0, y30, set size to 70 in order to fit comfortably on the scratch screen, then go to the back layer and finally show. We can throw that whole script into the transparent board sprite and just make one change. Rather than going to the back layer, we just move it to the front layer. Now, a few of you are probably thinking, well, why do we need two sprites for the board layered on top of each other? And why can't we instead just have one? The answer to that question is so that we can create an animation of the coin falling through the board. If the board is a single sprite, then either the coin will fall in front of the board or it will fall behind the board, neither of which are really satisfying to see. Adding two layers will allow us to kind of mimic the actual 3D Connect 4 where the coin actually falls through the board. Onto the coin, after init, set size to 72%. This is the size of each hole on the board. Then we make a variable called clone for this sprite only and then set it to no. This will only become relevant later on when we start to add clones to the project. So don't worry about it for the moment. Now go to x0, y120, 
show and then create another variable called column position for all sprites. Set this initially to 4. To help you make sense of this, I will explain the board notation. We have rows horizontally and columns vertically. Each one is numbered, so each circle on the board can be uniquely identified by its row and column ID as is shown on the screen. The numbers are ascending, starting from 1,1 on the top left. The column position refers to the column ID of the coin. The fourth column is smack dab in the middle of the screen and this is where the coin will initially hover over. When the game starts, we will set up a script that will go on until the game is over. If turn is red, then show and otherwise hide. Keep in mind here that later on, we will create another sprite to control the green coin and this current sprite will only be used for the red coin. It makes sense to create the second sprite afterwards because the code between the two is really so similar that we can duplicate it after completing this. Before we go on, let me quickly explain how the move on variable will work. While the game is going on, we can think of there being two different modes, before a move is made and during a move animation. During the former, move on will be set to yes and during the latter, move on will be set to no. Move on simply represents whether a player can move the coin using the arrow keys. We'd like the player to be able to do this before they decide on a move. But once a move is made and the coin is falling downwards to the particular square, we would like this movement to be disabled for a while. Getting back, if move on is yes, then go to y120 and x column position minus 4 multiplied by 41.6. What is going on here? In short, we are ensuring that the x position is just a function of the column position. Remember at the beginning, column position is 4. The fourth column is at an x position of 0. If we want the sprite to move one column to the left, then the x position must change by negative of the circle width. And if we wish the sprite to move one column to the right, then the x position must change by positive circle width. The circle width, or more simply the width of each column, is 41.6. To summarize, the higher above number 4 the column position, the more the coin shifts to the right, and the lower below the number 4, the more the coin shifts to the left. Once the game is completed, there is no longer any need for the coins, so just hide. It's now time to configure two extremely simple sensing scripts. That is when the right arrow and the left arrow keys are pressed. For the left arrow, check if clone is no, move on is yes, turn is red, and column position greater than one. If all of these conditions are met, change column position by minus one. The caveat of the column position greater than 1 should be easy to understand. If the column position is already to the extreme left, then we just restrict the movement. Similar stuff for the right key. In this case, movement must be limited on the right, so ensure that the column position is less than 7. If yes, then change column position by 1. Now for some testing. Hit the green flag and wow! The coin moves to the left and right at our whim, and as we expected, the movement is constrained to both ends of the screen. Quite an achievement, so pat yourself on the back if you've got the same result. Great, now let's have some quick cleanup and onward to the space key. This is where the coin has to fall down to its particular position. We will not be programming that animation in this video, but we will set it up in such a way that it can be easily done in part 2. So, if clone is no, move on is yes, and turn is red, then broadcast a new message called test move. The reason I called it test move and not move 
is because it may be the case that the particular column is full and there is no legal move on that column, in which case we wouldn't want anything to happen. Nonetheless, this is a topic that we will explore in detail in part 2. Before we end, let's do some indexing and set up a few lists in the control sprite. First, create two private variables called x and y. These will help us create a basic nested loop. At any given point in time, we would want to know which squares, or well, circles, are empty and which ones contain which color of the coin. We will save all of this in a new list called board. We will also use a second list called board coordinates that will help us make sense of the board list. This will come in extremely handy when we have to check if any player has won the game. Alright, let's start with init. In order to set up the lists quickly, create a custom block called init, making sure to run without screen refresh. Place it when the same init message is received. Within init, first delete all of the board, then repeat 42 times, add v to board. v represents vacant. Of course, at the start, all 42 tiles are vacant. Next, delete all of board coordinates. Now, it's time to set up a basic nested loop. So, set x to 1, repeat 6, this is the number of rows, then set y to 1, and nest to repeat 7, this is the number of columns. Within each loop, add join x, y to the board coordinates list. This will ensure that all of the 42 tiles are filled. To complete this loop and ensure that each tile has a unique address, change y by 1 in the inner loop and change x by 1 in the outer loop. If you are not familiar with nested loops, then this could be a bit daunting. But really, what are we trying to do here? Well, throughout the board coordinates list, we are trying to get a unique x and y value. We would like to have something like this, 1, 1, 1, 2, 1, 3, 1, 4, 1, 5, 1, 6, 1, 7, then 2, 1, 2, 2, and so on, all the way until 6, 7. In order to achieve this, the x variable just loops from 1 to 6, and each time the x variable is a particular number, the y variable loops from 1 to 7. The end result is an exact match with exactly what we need, except that this is so much faster than to code adding 42 numbers manually. Great, one last thing to do. When test move is received, we will have to check whether the coin can move, and if it can, then animate it. During this time, set move on to no. Okay, now for some final tests. Make sure you show the board and the board coordinates lists and then hit the green flag. And will you look at that? The board is full of Vs, while the board coordinates has 42 items filled exactly the way we wanted it. Perfect indeed and that is one big chunk of the game already complete. If you've enjoyed this video, then please make sure you leave a like and also don't forget to subscribe and turn on the notification bell. Thanks for watching and I will see you in part 2.